idea of reaching one place from another, of covering some crazy distance. I got that idea a while ago, maybe three years ago, roughly. At first, of course, I was thinking about the Caribbean islands, maybe about getting somewhere from Miami, from the Dominican Republic to Venezuela or something like that. Or from the Canary Islands to the islands of the Capo Verde. I was thinking about these crazy distances. Well, the way we did it was crazy. We got lucky, but I wouldn't recommend doing it to anyone else. Although maybe that's the only way to set a record. On the 1st of July, 2011, two Russian athletes, Yevgeny Novazhev and Konstantin Aksyonov, became the first people to kite surf across the Bering Strait, an extremely dangerous area between Eurasia and North America. The athletes spent seven hours in the freezing waters without a break and covered 175 kilometers, setting three records. They crossed the Bering Strait kite surfing. They crossed the water zone between Eurasia and North America and the international deadline. The idea of crossing the Bering Strait started to get real on Mauritius, where Yevgeny Navajev and Konstantin Aksyonov were training at a permanent kite surfing camp, Vivax. One day, the landlord of our villa told us a story about the previous owner of that house, the man who had built it. He was a French guy whose name was Baron Arnaud de Rosnay. We found some information online right away and read a story about how in 1979 this Baron Arnaud de Rosnay crossed the Bering Strait windsurfing from Alaska to the Chukotka Peninsula. And there were tons of pictures, an American flag and a flag of the Soviet Union. That was just unbelievable for that era. It wasn't that it was an incentive for us, it was more like a sign from above. And then we found out, and this was important to us, that some kite surfers from Europe, if I'm not mistaken, had tried to set the same world record. They tried to cross the Bering Strait. Now it was all that I could think about. It was giving me chills. It became an obsession, something incredible and hard to describe. I just wanted, really wanted to go there. And at the same time, we got this offer from our friends. Would you like to try the Bering Strait? And then I was just crazy about it. And without a moment's hesitation, I answered immediately, yes, and as soon as possible, yes, we'll do it. The athletes started to get ready for this challenging trip in February of 2011, but it was impossible to think through and plan every detail. The preparation process wasn't just about border formalities and other paperwork, it was more about analysing the meteorological conditions. I kept analysing it all, calling different people, calling some fishermen, asking them all about the real weather conditions. 
I was looking at the forecast for the next day or two and how much it could change and how different it was from what the locals were telling me, how different the real thing and the forecast were, and on the basis of all this information I reached my own conclusions. June the 23rd, Yevgeny Novazhev, Konstantin Aksyonov, Maria and Francesca Nesterenka, the coordinating team of the project, and the Chukotka Peninsula experts landed in Anadir, the largest city in Chukotka. The Chukotka Peninsula is an unreal place. I've never seen anything like this anywhere else for sure. It looks like nothing else, at least nothing like the southern countries or further abroad. It was immediately obvious. You could see it easily. It was like Mars. It was like some other planet. The distance between Alaska and the Chukotka Peninsula is almost 100 kilometers. So it's very important what the weather is like at the beginning of our trip, in the middle of it and at the end. If it can change so drastically and several times a day even in one place, then imagine how it can change over the course of our whole run. So we might be leaving Chukotka and there might be, for example, a north wind of about 15 meters per second. Then we need the same wind when we finish and the same direction too. And how do you get ready for all the extreme situations that might arise if the wind changes direction? And what will eventually happen to us and how we'll be able to get to our destination? Of course, when we got there, we kept discussing it with anyone we could think of. They got lucky right away. All the information sources predicted strong winds for the 29th of July. The forecast said that the strong wind would be constant across all the areas of the Bering Strait, which was extremely important for making a successful crossing. It was very important to start on the right day and at the right moment so that we could cover the distance in one go. As it was getting closer to the date, the forecast for the end of June and the beginning of July was stable. The only problem was that the wind was expected only for those three days, so they had to cross within a specific number of days. Communicating with the locals of the Chukotka Peninsula, Yevgeny mostly heard phrases like the weather here can change several times a day, the temperature of the water here is never warmer than plus one degrees Celsius, the currents here are so strong that sometimes a boat that moves against the current can just get stuck in the same spot, and a person who gets in this water here won't be able to survive longer than 10 minutes. The local sailors even call this place stale water.
We met the captain of the ship, Fyodor Sotnikov, who knows this place well. He voyages between the villages of Chukotka several times a summer, and he has been to the Bering Strait more than once. I believe that the main current will be right here. First of all, you need to raise the level of your safety, because the temperature of the water in the Bering Strait doesn't even reach 2 degrees Celsius. Another thing is that there are constantly drifting pack ice blocks. In fact, it's very risky and dangerous. For boats? Yes, and for you too. If you go, you have to go all the way. There's no way back. To be honest, he really scared us, telling us about this place. He didn't just warn us, he also recommended that we reconsider a thousand times over before we decide to do it. Because you can run into the so-called interference of the ocean waves. That's when the wind wave, formed by the wind, meets the counterflow. So the water turns into a mess. Even sailors are afraid of it. They're scared of going there. The route for crossing the Bering Strait looked like this. It started from the village of Uelin, near Cape Dejnob, then to the north of the Diomede Islands, towards the village of Wales in Alaska. In this case, the distance that the athletes had to cover was 97 kilometers. The run was supposed to take four or five hours. But these were only calculations on paper. Still, the main problem was that a good wind direction was needed to be able to start. At the end of June and for the whole of July, there is for the most part a southerly wind in Chukotka. Going out in the ocean when there is a southerly is like signing a death warrant. The only way out was to wait for the north wind to come. According to our route, we had to get from Anadir to Cape Dejnyov as soon as possible. But since those places are absolutely wild and you have to use all manner of crazy forms of transport, we were warned that we would need to get on an off-roader or we could wait for the plane that flew between these two settlements. But there was a chance that we'd buy a ticket for a helicopter or a plane and wouldn't be able to take off for a week or two because of the weather conditions. Almost as soon as the athletes got to Chukotka, the weather gave them an unpleasant surprise. Flying to Lavrentia and then to the starting point in Uelen was not possible for four days due to bad weather. The athletes had no other choice but to go sightseeing in Chukotka. One of the attractions there is an abandoned military bunker. It's an abandoned, godforsaken place. When we entered the bunker, we were just amazed by the size of this place. It was so well laid out and well built because it was such a secret place back in the day. Because here it is, America on one side and the Soviet Union on the other. And on both sides there used to be troops, always ready for action. This bunker was supposed to become a school in case of a war, a kindergarten. There was a huge amount of ammunition.
It was an unreal journey in a giant off-roader that rumbled so badly you could feel the pressure building inside your ears. First it drove on the road and then it just turned off it in the middle of nowhere. It drove across a giant field and we went through all these ravines and streams. We came out onto the coast of the Gulf of Anadir where there was snow still. Apparently it never melts there. The air temperature, as far as I could gather, could warm up to 15 to 18 degrees Celsius, but the snow was still hanging over the water. You could tell that the ice had just melted and it looked incredible. Also, you could see the bald mountains, these low mountains, small hills, and on the north side of these hills, there's a lot of snow that also never melts. In fact, this snow doesn't melt even in the summer. These contrasts are really striking. June the 28th, Yevgeny and Konstantin finally take off on a small plane heading for the village of Lavrentia. We really wanted to get to Cape Dijnyov as soon as possible. And then this happens. The weather prevents any flying. There's no way a helicopter can fly, so we have to stay put. We stayed in Lavrentia and decided to ride and test our equipment. We inflated our size 12 kites, although the wind was about 10 to 12 meters per second. First we decided to ride the bigger kites, I mean the oversized one that were too big for this wind, in case the wind dies out. They call it overdosing. And this overdosing could save us, we could clip and tighten the kites. But if the wind dies, it can cause major problems. In order not to freeze to death in the icy waters of the Bering Strait, the athletes put on several layers of thermal underwear, snowboard gear, and on top of all this, special membrane dry suits. Test results showed that wearing all this, it is possible to stay in the water for about 20 minutes. The water in Laventia was not the same as in Anadir, and as we'd been told by the locals, it was already closer to the temperature of the Bering Strait. It was really cold, even to the touch. It was impossible to hold your hand in the water for longer than 10 seconds. It burned just like boiling water. June 30th. The village of Lavrentia. Perfect weather for the start. Yevgeny and Konstantin are waiting for the helicopter to arrive, but it hasn't come. Using the satellite phone, they find out that the helicopter with the Border Patrol members on board can't fly to the start point due to the weather conditions in the village of Lavrentia. It's impossible to start without a stamp from the Border Patrol in the passport. The fact of crossing the border needs to be recorded. The helicopter can't fly out until 4.30 p.m. That's when the last flights are made in Chukotka. Another day is wasted.
The morning of July the 1st, La Vrintia, 0, 0 weather, northwest wind, 3 to 5 meters per second, which is definitely not enough. At the start point in Uelen, the weather is the same. In the middle of the route, on Big Dermid Island, it's even worse. Overcast and visibility towards Cape Dishnyov is only 5 kilometers. Plus, the wind is coming from the south at 4 to 5 meters per second. The weather couldn't be worse. But Yevgeny decides to start with conditions like this. The group is flying out to the start point in Uelen village. There was a very negative moment when we heard the border control talking to Big Damid Island, where the border point is situated, and they told us about the current weather. There was a southerly wind of about three to four meters per second. Then we were like, oh man. It was like some kind of dream. I still can't remember what was happening to me. It was something quite unreal. I don't know what was pushing me, what kind of instincts, but we got ready quick and were full of confidence. We prepared ourselves, checked everything, set our GPS and headed out. And realized this is it. Now we have to leave this continent and get to the next one. And there's no way back. At 3.30 p.m. local time, Yevgeny and Konstantin got in the water and headed towards the state border of the Russian Federation. Turning around a cliff, they headed out towards Cape Dejnyov, where they were planning to get in contact by radio with the accompanying boats. But when they got there, there was no connection. Wasting no time, they decided to start their ride, expecting the boats to contact them. When they were three to four kilometers away from Cape Dejnyov towards the state border, the connection with the boats was finally fixed, but there was no visual contact. Then, after two or three kilometers, they saw the accompanying boats. They were moving behind the athletes while there was connection and visibility. If something had gone wrong, the boats could have helped the athletes. First, everything went to plan. But a half an hour later, the weather started to change. Sometimes the sun would come out and then it would become foggy. Sometimes visibility was just about a few dozen meters. The athletes were moving about 150 meters away from one another. An hour later, the boats refused to accompany the athletes any further. I was trying to talk them into staying as hard as I could until the very last moment. And this last moment happened somewhere around five to eight kilometers away from Diomede Island. They said they just couldn't go any further. Now they had to continue on their own. 
Of course, all kinds of bad thoughts about how it would all end kept crossing my mind. Even if the wind stopped when we'd already made 80 kilometers, it'd be bad enough because it would be almost impossible to swim for the rest of the time. Those 10 kilometers. Our way seemed unbelievably long, especially the distance between the islands. And then I started falling a lot. As soon as you relax, you fall. It's like a shock. You fall and then you regain consciousness because the water gets under your helmet. Not very pleasant sensations. When we were getting close to Big Diomede, almost in front of the island, I saw the back of a whale. Man, I rode over a whale. It came out of the water right in front of me. I'd already met whales before in other countries, but they were more cautious. This one obviously wasn't going to get out of my way or change his direction. And I didn't have any other option apart from riding over him. Well, that's exactly what happened. It was a huge green-grey body, a giant spine, covered with barnacles and all kinds of stuff. I tried to stop and actually took a couple of breaks, because you had to rest. It got pretty hard when we were halfway there. Also, because of this thought that there was still the same distance ahead of us, we started thinking about turning towards the island of Little Diomede, with a small village on it. It looked so good. It was also on the west side. So when the sun was out and shining, it looked like some kind of paradise, where if anything happened, you could go. So we were having these thoughts, and then suddenly the village was being left behind. You were on autopilot, riding, and the village was receding into the background. And you began to realize that you had to go on about the same distance as you'd already traveled. It was a very unpleasant feeling when we were almost at the border and my eyes started to close. I started falling asleep. I remembered right away all those stories about people freezing to death because they let themselves fall asleep. It gets cold and it makes them sleepy. We somehow got through this, we made it. When we were five kilometers away from Little Diamond, we saw a little piece of land. A small piece of Alaska. They were small mountains with some snow patches on them. After that, after we saw the first piece of land, we got our second wind. We got some more energy. So we just kept pushing. It cheered us up, of course, but not for a long time, because five minutes later the land disappeared again. And there was again only a whiteout in front of you. The only thing that got easier as we went on was that the water got a little bit warmer. So when you stopped, you could stay in the water not just for 30 seconds, but for about a whole minute, maybe even a little longer than that. We could feel that we'd now got to the water where the south current dominated. It all lasted till we saw the first lights. There was a light and first we thought it was a lighthouse, but later it turned out to be the lights of a local aerodrome. As soon as we saw that light, that was it. Later, we laughed when we looked at our route on the GPS. At first, our route was really wide. We were tacking. But as soon as we saw the light, it just became a straight line towards the shore.
When I got out of the water and stepped on the ground, onto the land. Now I remember it like some kind of dream, you know, that I just saw while I was sleeping. I just remember how I stepped on the land and said to myself, here's my first step, we've made it, that's it. I don't know how to describe those emotions, but I was really thirsty, I was simply exhausted. I could barely even walk, to be honest. I put my kite on the ground and fell down next to it. And then just waited for Konstantin to get there. He'd got left a little behind by about a kilometer, I think. A couple of minutes later I caught his kite and now both of us were there. I would recommend crossing the Bering Strait. It's really interesting. It's interesting water, an interesting experience. Plus, you don't ride wearing board shorts like in Egypt or in Vietnam or on Mauritius. Here you have to wear a dry suit. It's interesting physically and takes some mental preparation as well. You have to be ready. I mean, you need to have decent emergency boats. They need to accompany you all along the way, not just as was in our case, where we were accompanied for 20 kilometers and then we continued on our own. Two Russian athletes managed to do something that many people can only dream of. They were risking their own lives every second in that freezing water. Kite surfing, they crossed a very dangerous patch of the ocean between Russia and America, the Bering Strait. And not for the sake of a record or for glory, they just needed to test themselves. Yevgeny Novazhev and Konstantin Aksyonov can't even imagine any other kind of life.